fuel the theft of other people's natural resources because you've messed up our land. <laughs>
Uh, there are there are very successful. Anyone that plays video games, for example, will know some of the successful businesses and industries we have in this country. Uh, anyone that's involved in the media world, some of our biggest exports come from the BBC. There's a whole host of things that we do. One of the, one of the problems is there isn't enough of that. We have been over the last decade far too dependent on the City of London. And City of London money is, is volatile. Sometimes it didn't even exist, as we've discovered. So we had a, a, a severe imbalance, I think, in the way the economy has developed in this country. But the future, it seems to me, has to lie in asking that question, the, the pompadour question, which is, what are we going to export 30 years from now? And what do we have to do to support that? That's the question about infrastructure. And infrastructure isn't just about roads. Infrastructure is about fiber optics. Infrastructure is about fast broadband, which we don't have in Britain. They have in Paris, but they, we don't have it in this country. We seem to be more than happy with slow digital speeds and so on. Um, but somewhere along the line, we've got to gear up into the century that we find ourselves in. And it isn't going to involve us getting dirt under our fingernails. It isn't going to, it is, it isn't going to involve people going underground, however much you might want it to be the case. But it does involve getting involved in a whole host of new businesses, new industries, new patterns of education are needed. Education is the most important of the, all the infrastructures. And I, I wait to hear political party, including the one I've been a member of for 40 years, starting to talk like that. When they do, I've no doubt that somewhere along the line somebody's going to be a, a, a naysayer. But that would be a party very similar in many ways to what Margaret Thatcher was trying to do. <laughs> 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 has actually worked against this country because there are so many other industries that rely on it and open up around the cross field. Not just the steel industry, but all sorts of other smaller industries. And also, of course, the retail and all the other add-ons and service industries. It was a disaster for this country, closing, closing the coal fields. Of course it was. And what I said at the beginning of this was it was a, and all because it was an argument between two people that wouldn't shift. It was, it was two people that were, if they had just negotiating properly. But of course, the government of the day wanted to close the coal industry because they were sick of, they were sick of, as they saw it, the power of the unions. They wanted to kill the unions. That was an entirely a wrong decision, but that's what they did. And I, I keep saying, coal is in again. And somebody said, it's expensive. It isn't, actually. This country produces the cheapest coal in Europe at the present time, including coal mined in Poland. Because we've got the technology. It's different technology now. We do it in a different way. And clean burn is very important. People keep saying CO2 and stuff. Look, burning coal is a lot cleaner than your incinerators. Are built. They, they are building incinerators all over the place to burn rubbish. That rubbish has got mercury light in it. It's got all sorts of batteries. It's got all sorts of... Excuse me, uh, let me finish. I'm making a point. The stuff that, the stuff that goes up the chimney is filthy. And that is clean. So if you can if you can get mercury out and get lead out, coal is a pussycat. You can burn coal and have clean burn, no problem. And somebody keeps shouting, uh, how many years is that going to last? Well, if it lasts 200 years, by that time, I'm sure in 50 years, never mind 200 years, we will have coal. Oh, so we'll have far good. different technology to carry us through, but we still need coal. We need coal because oil's running out. Um, Unless we have nuclear fuel, and I think we should, I really do think there should be a competitive to nuclear, and don't start shouting at windmills all the time, they're not viable. They're not viable because the subsidy on windmills 
you have to subsidise them in order to, to get even anything out of them. They're not viable. Look at the figures. Go back to coal and let's have nuclear to support it. But basically, we must be missing out on coal. Okay, let's, let's let, let the panel, excuse me, let the panel, because the gentleman asked for the panel to answer his question, correct? Well, well, I would say, actually, there still is a lot for coal. A lot, and I would disagree with you over wind power. Actually, wind power is capital intensive to build. Yes. And furthermore, we don't see the one wretched place we had that was um, going to make it on the Isle of Wight ended up being uh, closed down following factory campaigns that I'm afraid to say have been a Tory MP. Yeah. 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 If they won't work with that subsidy, coal will. Yeah. Well, 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 a fair amount of dignity, or they tried to, until that strike, which then ended with the destruction of those uneconomic pits. Yeah. And economic, and worse than that, a lot of economic pits, or pits were made to be uh, uneconomic. And there is, a, there is actually a considerable room for us, at least in the medium term, to have coal, uh, so that we're less dependent, actually, on oil, which is, and gas in particular, which could come from um, from abroad as well. And on top of that, I, I, I might add, I am always worried about nuclear power. They say there are never any accidents in the nuclear industry, but we only need one for the country to go to the other time. So the coal is much safer than that. So. George, in the back. Well, I, I'd feel a lot more comfortable about nuclear power if you didn't have to dress up like a spaceman to go into one. <laughs> <laughs> Now, 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 we know, now we know the future as seen by Edwina. It's making video games. When the Tories came in, when the Tories came in, Britain had a coal industry, a steel industry, a shipbuilding industry, a car industry, a truck industry, a motorcycle industry, a railway workshop industry. We were a workshop of the world. Yeah. when the Tories came. We were a workshop of the world when the Americans were still riding the range as cowboys in the Wild West. And look at us now, looking to a future of video games. And the idea that there's something wrong with subsidy is a triumph of accountancy over economics. Accountancy is about counting numbers. Economics is about the bigger picture. Because you close down a mine, because you won't subsidize it, and then you subsidize the unemployed for generations afterwards. Yeah. You close down a mine. <laughs> you close down an industry rather than subsidize it and end up spending hundreds of billions and the lives of hundreds of thousands for wars overseas in order to make up for what you had yourselves and you destroyed. Mm -hmm. These people are economic illiterates. As Oscar, Wilde, as Oscar Wilde put it, they know the price of everything and the value of nothing. And they certainly don't know the value of a community that goes to work every day, which has a real community, neighbours, workmates, and anybody who's toured the wasteland, they say April's the cruelest month, do it next month. Tour the wastelands that these people left behind them and see the human dereliction, never mind the physical dereliction that they left. And you'll never dare dream of re-electing this mob ever again. <laughs>
fuel or not. You see, if if the coal industry belonged to us as it should have done, as it used to and as it should do now, then the question of whether we continue to mine it, whether we need it, whether it will destroy the ozone layer and all that, that's something that uh, scientists and people who know about these things work out, we discuss, we take a decision, the communities are supported, you plan for new industries to come in gradually, you retrain, and the community stays intact. So it's not a question of is coal a dirty fuel or a clean fuel, it's a question of power. Do we have the power to control what we produce, how we produce it, how we transform it? Because of course, things will change. I mean, science moves on. Uh, it may well be that we still need coal and it can be burned cleanly. It may well be that we have to change fuels. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. But I do know that the community should not have to pay the price. We should be able to plan what we do. And we could have done if it hadn't been privatised and everything else. We could have said, yes, let's keep the mines for another 10 years, 20 years, we'll gradually transform it into something else, the jobs are protected, the apprenticeships are protected, and so on. We should be, we, 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 we have the knowledge, we just have the power has been taken away from us. So it's a political question, it's not a scientific one. Thank you. And it operated 
most uh, eloquently through the media, through television, through broadcasting, through the press. And um, th that's, that goes back to 1926, to the general strike, when the BBC, which was run by Lord Reith, the founder at the time, and uh, he was under pressure from, this is time for a quick story, he was under pressure from Churchill, who ran a newspaper during the general strike called the British Gazette, and Churchill wanted to requisition the BBC and use it as a mouthpiece for government. And Baldwin, who was the Prime Minister, and one or two others said, don't be so hasty. It's much better that they think the BBC is objective, because then they will believe them. If you use it as a propaganda rag, of course they won't believe it, and we lose our, one of our best weapons. And so, of course, the BBC, ever since, has maintained this notion of impartiality. But at the time of the general strike, the news bulletins were written in a government office. And they might well have been written in the government office for the bias shown against the miners in this trial. Would you like to say years ago. The miners' strike finished 25 years ago today. Actually, nobody's mentioned uh, tonight, and it seems very odd if I do, but Michael Foot died today, and he was the leader of the Labour Party at the time. Uh, I had the greatest respect for Michael Foot. He was a decent, honourable, well-meaning, extremely bright man from an astonishing family that has given great service to this country. And just a minute. Uh, just a minute. The trouble was, he, he did what some of you have done here tonight. He would stand up and make fantastic speeches. And everybody would cheer. And they would march on. And the trouble was, he was speaking to the converted, just as you've been doing. And outside, people were saying, no. Margaret Thatcher was elected. The Conservatives were elected in 79. They were elected in 83 with a huge majority. They were elected again in 1987. Whatever happened with the miners' strike, that was likely to happen. The nation, the population in this country, and something like 75, 77% used to vote then, were voting for change. They were voting for the future. I have people coming to my constituency, into the, into the uh, surgery, the vice group, the wives, not the men, very macho industry we've been talking about, but the wives, saying quietly, do you think there's any chance of getting gas installed in our villages? because we're sick and tired of clearing out the clinker at 7 o'clock in the morning. We want to have the same life as everybody else. And that was all we were trying to do, is try and give them, and you may or may not accept this, but I think people here are pretty fair-minded, that actually conservative MPs elected to represent mining areas were trying to do exactly that, exactly what you want, trying to give the people there a good life, a prosperous life, a future, one in which hard work and effort and brains are going to be rewarded. But we all knew it was going to be a different life from the life of a hundred years before. It had to change, and it has to change again now. So crushing the miners within the 79 manifesto, wasn't it? You're telling me they were to crush the miners in 79, is that what you're saying? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You tried to say that the Tories were elected in 79 to crush the miners. The Tories were elected in 1979 because of my well, because strikers have brought down the last government, which happened to be a Labour one. Well, have you forgotten that? Have you forgotten that? That's why people voted Conservative. They had enough of strikes. They had enough of it. And when it came to 1983, they voted Margaret with even bigger majority. Yeah, and that's why she fought the miners, and that's why she won. Well, there's gentlemen there that have been, excuse me, gentlemen there that have been very patient. Four million dollars. That means another one. 25 years ago, 55 years ago, I said to my father, I want to go with my friends in the pit. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do with you, son. Put your foot in that cage and I'll break both your legs. It's a dirty, dangerous job. Now, the last 30 years of my working life was in a mortuary. And I've assisted in literally thousands of post-mortems on miners. I've had to talk to miners' relatives. It is a dirty, dangerous job and I have the utmost respect for miners, so you know where I'm coming from. Now one thing is, I've just been elected as a councillor, and the first thing I was told is, you are politically naive. <coughs> a gentleman over there said, Westminster is a live, 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 gone. 
if not, it's a dirty big car. And it's the same in local governments. I don't trust any politician. I joined the council, I didn't trust the opposition, and then I found out even in my own group I didn't trust them. So tonight, what I, what I really would like, I would like the panel, and, and this is an honest, straightforward question, forget Arthur Scargill, forget Mrs. Thatcher, look at the situation we're in today. We're sitting on thousands of tons of coal, we've got unemployment, yeah. we're buying coal in, now I would like the panel to tell me, there's an election coming off soon, if you were now going to form a government, what would your priorities be? Good question. Who would like to well, I'm on the South in uh, Westminster MP, so maybe uh, I should answer that. Ken, Ken Lodge and I are members of the Respect Party, and if anyone's interested in our ideas, they can go to the web to the Respect Party uh, website and see where we stand. We hope to elect three members of Parliament in just 60 days' time, two in East London and one in Birmingham. And if it's a hung Parliament, I hope it's a hung Parliament depending on three votes. And if it is, <laughs> if it is, well, stranger things have happened. If it is, our conditions for supporting our government will be this that a start is made to a major national house building drive to house the overcrowded and homeless people in many parts of the country, giving a boost to the construction industry, the steel industry, and the other industries that are, uh, because investment in construction is tremendously productive in job creation because of the sheer number of different trades that are involved in construction and the making of the materials. Secondly, that we use our ownership of the banks, our ownership of the banks, which we never asked for, but for which we paid through the nose, to use those banks to reinvest in resurrecting British manufacturing capacity. Reopen the coal mines that have not been irrevocably flooded and invest in clean coal technology. And last but not least, a date be set for the withdrawal of British forces from the foreign wars that we've been sent into around the world, not least because we have no energy and fuel industry of our own, and save those young men from being killed in foreign fields for the fat cats that Edwina Curry represents. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, but we have to. I, 
I think most people will realise that the first thing any government has to do, whether it's a home parliament or not, is do something about our horrendous deficit. Because if you we don't... Well, now listen. Because if we don't do something about our horrendous deficit, British sovereign debt will be downrated. And then we really can all worry about pensions. Then we can really all worry about all sorts of aspects of the way that the economy runs. And this would be a, a, a serious lurch downhill in ways that could not be put right uh, for a very, very long time. That's very, very important. It's got to be done. Um, David Cameron said that what he wants to do is cut taxes on business. I'd answer that. I would, I would do something slightly different. I'd do what Russia has been doing, which is cut taxes on everything. Russia has a flat rate tax. Oh it's 13% it's tax on income. Wouldn't that be nice? It's 13% tax on, uh, on business profits, corporation tax. That would be lovely. And it's 13% tax on expenditure, on uh, VAT. What you do then, as, as, as we found out over 20 years ago, it's actually more money comes in. More money comes in because more people are prepared to come to register their businesses and to pay the taxes. And then you've got more money with which to do all the things that George wants to do, that I want to do, whether it's infrastructure, uh, whatever it is. But at the moment, at the moment, we've been spending money we do not have. We've all been spending money we do not have, and the government in particular. And until that is put right, we're not in a position to make any decisions about the future. That's got to be the priority. Thank you. Yeah. Well, well I, I, actually, I, I, I would disagree with quite a bit of this. One, uh, when you say we didn't spend money, we haven't had. We've actually been spending money giving it to bankers and basically maybe bankrupted the country. It's not, I mean, I wish we had been spending more money. <laughs> Services, but actually most of it is going to say. Health services are not improved. No, health services are important. We have spent some money. It's not improved? Uh, I guess it has improved. Of course it's not. But, 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 it's going to throw hundreds of thousands of people out of work. It's going to mean that major cities that are already in trouble, people are going to have less money. I would reverse the capital uh, plans for massive cuts in infrastructure, which the, is the moment in the government. And I'm afraid I would introduce some new taxes. I don't know how much they would raise, but I am absolutely fed up with non Dong, Lord Ashcroft type yes. figures. Who think they can use this country <laughs> as a nice place uh, to take advantage of all the decent arts and facilities and everything they've got in the health service if they want to use it or not, depending on it, and swan out of it and not pay a huge amount of tax? I would introduce a differential passport. I've introduced a non dom passport for a number of days, and I'm afraid it would cost a million pounds a year to renew it. <laughs> I would introduce a luxury tax on corporate jets and yachts costing yeah. over a hundred grand. And if people go and buy them abroad, well, okay, I'll show it from Portland. Well, okay, but it would actually show a sense of direction that I think that the uh, widening gap between the poor and the, and the rich in this country, okay, it might, it might not, and then eventually be, within a year, I would be very careful and try and bring down, but I would actually try and get get something done. Because, I mean, the thing is, we do have an international elite. We think they can walk in and out of Britain in any country and be subject to no rules whatsoever and pay no taxes to us. Yet they want to have the same benefits. You know, and I think it's time something was done about it. Probably won't be, I mean, it probably won't be a lot, but I'm like, yeah, yeah, I
a great experience for me. It has been an honor to be with the panel and an even greater honor to be with you tonight. And it's to thank you, Alan and Cheryl Gerard of the Art Bay for organizing <laughs> to me, that'd be great. Um, what did you make of, uh, of tonight's meeting? Um, very interesting. Um, I didn't realise how strong local opinion was. Um, I know we're governed by a league of council locally, but uh, there's very strong opinions coming from as far, as far as Liverpool, Nottingham, and local areas. Uh, I myself live in a, an expat village, which is brought to its knees by the um, the Civil War, the inverted commas. What intrigues me, uh, the issue I would like to have brought up, was the fact that at the time I was uh, a young man, late teens, and the police thought it was right to take off their numbers. They thought it was right to bring in forces from different parts of the country. They thought it was right to be ruled by the government and to beat down uh, the common working man. Uh, and the government thought it had the right to take away um, earnings, communities, in effect, uh, supporting their families, and it was governed by, inverted commas, the bully boys of Margaret Thatcher. Uh, and I think the young people today should have been uh, shown this and highlighted this. And whatever their point of view, they should be aware in the future that the government will beat them down. Um, Edwina Curry received quite a negative view. Um, she was fairly defensive though, right? Well, yeah, of course she was a representative of the government, um, so uh, how heartily she shouldn't take um, the blame herself. But she did support certain views and they were pointed out that her views and the government uh, and Margaret Thatcher changed the rules uh, and broke the rules uh, and brought out new laws to oppress uh, the miners, and before that the car workers, and before that steel workers. And really again it was highlighted there was a social divide. 
um, uh, Margaret Thatcher and the Conservative government represented by Edwina uh, made a wholehearted um, outward battle against um, the working man and Labour Party. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Simon Powell, uh, originally from Stoke itself, now living in Silverdale, like I said, an ex-pit pit, pit, pit village, probably uh, six miles away from here. First off, you should give your name and your position if you were involved with the strikes. Name, Chad Owen, member of the National Union of Mine Workers. I thought there was a groundswell in there tonight. I thought it was a very, very passionate uh, audience. Uh, it was always going to be uh, that way because of what went on 25 years ago. So you were talking to uh, an audience that was prepared for it uh, and was very much involved in that strike of 25 years ago. But there was also a groundswell of young people in there tonight who were, from what I can gather, very interested, very keen as to what went on and why. <coughs> so do you think that the, the audience is very 50-50 or do you think it was very swinging one way? Uh, no, I, I, I think there was a, uh, there was a, a broad section of uh, all sorts of views in there tonight. But again, uh, a lot of people in there tonight were involved in, in all sorts of ways. Uh, 25 years ago in that strike. But it's, it's, it's what we learned, it's what's come from that strike, where we were and where we are and how far forward. That's if we've come forward from 25 years ago. And again, there was an opinion in there which I was picking up, which said, uh, we haven't moved at all. We haven't moved forward. If anything at all, we've gone backward. Because uh, manufacturing industry in this country now has gone elsewhere. And for whatever reasons, for whatever governments of the day we're in, uh, we were left behind. And maybe we were sold out. Maybe people ought to start looking at that. Were we sold out? 25 years ago by successive governments since. Uh, line of thought there for anybody. Much appreciated. Yeah, well, uh, Alan Gerrard, where am I looking? Do I look in there? Yeah, yeah. Alan Gerrard, I'm the organiser of the uh, debate. <coughs> and, and what did you make of tonight? As expected or? Yeah, pretty much so. Um, I think that Pretty much it was a, a reasoned debate, you know, we had a, a fairly wide uh, breadth of viewpoints, you know, from left and right. Edwina Curry came along, which was very good because it was, it could have been pretty much a, a left-wing sort of slagging off of like the Thatcher government, you know, which was uh, one scenario that was uh, in the back of my mind. But uh, Edwina Curry, you know, put up a good display, so that was quite good. Um, and it was good that we moved on to a, into other issues as well, like you know the, the forthcoming election as well. So I was quite pleased that it didn't just stick, you know, uh, into into the, the past. You know, it did move forward. So what did you make of the audience? Uh, quite feisty tonight. Yeah, well, it would be, wouldn't it? Because you know, I mean, you're looking back at a time where there was, you know, a great deal of animosity. Animosity would still exists as well. You know, I mean, we've had phone calls from irate sack miners who, uh, who still who still won't walk past a you know a scab without you know spitting in the face and all that kind of stuff you know we had one guy who said he was going to put a picket up outside tonight and uh, that kind of animosity just just doesn't go away you know and uh, I think there's a reason why the term you know scab and filth exists and it's nothing to do with workers themselves it's uh, the people in power who abuse the trust you know and uh, that's those are the issues we wanted to get at tonight, really, to see exactly who was to blame for, for what went wrong, you know. And where did the idea from this debate come from? Where, where, what was that based on and, and, and who was mainly involved with that? Well, it's basically my wife and mine, our idea, really. You know, it's, there, are, there haven't been many other inputs, really. Uh, one idea, um, one motivation, really, was that... Uh, we felt it's, it was such an important event for all working class people uh, that what happened in the miners' strike was such a destructive event. It led on to the decimation of 
you know, whole industries after that time, uh, that uh, it needed to be remembered. And there didn't seem to be anything going on elsewhere in the country uh, to commemorate the Miley strike. We thought that we had to do something here in Stoke. And I'm really glad that we've, we've put it on here, you know, because it's not just Yorkshire and South Wales where you've got the pits. It's here as well, and sometimes people forget that because, you know, you think of Stoke on Trent, and people sort of think, well, oh, it's the pottery, you know, but it was the coal that, you know, that built up the pottery industry. So uh, I'm really glad it's happened here, and uh, hopefully it's been, a, you know, an enjoyable evening for everyone.